Hi everybody, T Morris here. This five minute paranormal is gonna probably run longer than five minutes because it's a different kind of review for us. Not a product review, but a review nonetheless of 28 Days Haunted, a new series on Netflix centered around three teams working on a theory proposed by the iconic paranormal team of Lorraine and Ed Warren. While I am about to share some strong opinions on this series, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So go on ahead and leave them in the comments. And while you're there, like and subscribe. We have some terrific content coming on Halloween and in the weeks to come. Now, for my review of 28 Days Haunted, a six-part documentary series that I watched so you wouldn't have to. The concept put by the Warrens was that paranormal activity happens within a 28-day cycle, beginning on day one of an investigation and culminating to the 28th day when the veil between the physical and spiritual world is the thinnest. The producers of this grand experiment, New England Society for Psychic Research's Tony Spera and Ghost Adventures' own Aaron Sagers, set three teams across the country, one in Colorado, one in Connecticut, and a third in North Carolina to embark on a 28-day investigation. No mobile phones, no background information, taken to the site with utmost secrecy, only the most basic of contact with the outside world in case of emergencies. Armed only with psychics and sensitives and tools of the trade, the three teams set out to try and figure out who is haunting them. Pretty neat concept, right? It is, until you see how hard these teams ramp up their investigation strategies in the premiere episode. One team going so far as to put their teammate into a coffin and hold a mock funeral in order to make a better connection with the spirits. And this is day one, with 27 to go. Here is the first problem that the series stumbles over. Remember, the Warren's theory is that activity is supposed to ramp up over a 28 day period. To keep people watching this series though, these episodes need to be constantly ramping up the tension and, as perpetuated by shows of this vein, the danger. And after episode one, you're expecting that five episodes later we'll be seeing heads literally spinning and bodies bent back while floating up to the ceiling. Spoiler alert, they ain't. While we really don't see a lot of investigating, we do get a lot of gimmicks. Along with the investigator in the coffin, we also get over-the-top taunting, isolation tanks, paranormal activity caught off-camera when the area is clearly covered by cameras, and brace for impact, the God Helmet. Because yeah, prolonged exposure of your brain to amped up magnetic fields is more than okay. And could someone explain to me why the God Helmet looks a lot like a Thanos helmet that was picked up in the toy clearance bin at your local Target? Anyone? Anyone? No? Okay, we're moving on. If there is one redeeming element in this train wreck, it's Amy, the sensitive on the Colorado team who in episode three finally calls out the paranormal bro code on her teammates, who are disappointed she refuses to do something she perceives as truly dangerous. Amy becomes my hero in that moment, only to be brosplained by her team in the following episode how important it was to push themselves. Then there's the unexplained evidence miraculously and conveniently appearing on site, ranging from a buried pentagram, spoiler alert, not every star is a pentagram, to a random photo that happened to be a family killed brutally on the location, spoiler alert, the family never lived on the location that was being investigated, to the photocopy of a newspaper article from the 1970s found in mint condition between two rocks of a musty, unused stone basement. All this culminating to a setup for a possible season two and a final check-in with the North Carolina team that is reminiscent of every B-horror movie from the 1960s. Not since Stephen Prozac Shippey and his Haunting on Dice Road film have I felt this conned. Of course, Spera and Sagers will be able to sleep at night, along with the paranormal investigators who played along in this massive punking, on account of the disclaimer at the beginning of each episode. This is, as stated by the show's creators and producers, a social experiment. You know, like the Stanford Prison Experiment. So already, with this disclaimer kept in mind, the convenience of evidence, the stunning footage of paranormal activity, and the off-camera incidents 
suddenly seem less organic and more manufactured, especially when you consider these ridiculously blocked sight lines. And how do you go 28 days and not pick up one single EVP? Phil and I can barely go 28 minutes without picking up one. Why 28 Days Haunted evokes such a strong reaction from me is how people may actually buy into this as being a true depiction of paranormal investigation. 28 Days Haunted is what it says it is at the beginning of each episode, a social experiment with paranormal investigation as the backdrop. And in a similar vein with the Stanford experiment, this is a bad idea that unfolds exactly as one would imagine it. At its worst, 28 Days Haunted perpetuates every negative stereotype. At its best? Well, there is no best here. This six-episode documentary series is a raging dumpster fire of everything sensational in paranormal investigation depicted on television. Whew. And thank you so much for watching. I hope this review saves you a few hours on Netflix. On behalf of everyone here at OSI, take care. Stay safe, and we'll see you in the field.